Previously on Funny Science Fiction. I uh, dreamed about playing basketball uh, professionally until I finally woke up and realized I'm a slow white Jewish guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Funny Science Fiction Podcast. The podcast where the profanity has been filtered and the jokes probably should have been too. <laughs> Our guest today is the New York Times bestselling author, Dayton Ward. Dayton, meet Drayton. Drayton, meet Dayton. This won't be confusing at all. No, shouldn't be. I know who I am. <laughs> now, what I was surprised to find out about, and you guys might be too, and many may, people may not knew, know, is that uh, Dayton Ward is a self-defense expert. He holds a black belt in the new age martial arts of Kirk Fu. This is okay. correct. Maybe not a black belt, but he has written a manual of Kirk Fu moves. That's right, a fully illustrated book available on DaytonWard.com for only $14.99. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> only so, I thought to bring a copy to the show, but it won't show oh, up on the green screen. Okay. Uh, well. <laughs> what, floor, yeah. I be able to see it? what was it about the magnificent of Kirk's fighting style that made you step back and say, you know what, this is what I need to write a book about. <laughs> but even more importantly than that, what fighting move shown in the book will you be employing that fateful night when you're cornered in a dark alley? Oh, well, the idea for the book came about while I was working on another book for that publisher, Inside Editions. I was working on a travel guide to the planet Vulcan, which is exactly what you think it is. Nice. And they came to me with that idea, and I ran with it. And while I was finishing up that book, I had this idea of pitching a, a, a parody of self-defense manuals like you'd see in the military. Uh, but I wanted to... <laughs> But I wanted to focus on Kirk Fu. And I had written an article for Star Trek.com about my 10 favorite Kirk fighting moves years ago. That's awesome. So I pitched it to my editor and I was half joking and half hoping that kind of thing. <laughs> In other words, I was prepared to laugh it off as a joke if he told me no, you know, so that my feelings wouldn't be hurt. But no, no I wasn't serious. No, no, it's good. Yeah, I, wasn't, I didn't really mean that. And then, <laughs> uh, he actually went for the idea and he said, that's great. I can't wait. We should try to do that. So I wrote up a pitch. A formal pitch and uh, submitted it and then CBS approved it and they gave me a green light and so I started diagramming Kirk's moves by rewatching the shows. And there you go. That's I gotta awesome. see this book. Yeah. Figuring out how to break it down into step one, step two, step three and then um, and then they partnered me with a with an illustrator Christian Cornea who just flat out knocked it out of the park. Uh, yes. It's, my pitch was I wanted all of the text to be written straight. So no jokes, no snark, no nothing. I wanted to be uber serious, and I wanted the illustrations to convey the humor and the absurdity of it. So it worked fine. Christian, Christian totally knocked it out of the park. That is yeah, awesome. The, uh, the the little bit I saw of it on your website. Uh, just full disclosure, I'm not a huge Star Trek fan. But well, I you're in the right business then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pro probably not. Uh, but I honestly, I, I would buy that book. I think it's hysterical. The it's little awesome. bit I saw of it, the illustrations that that were drawn for it, totally sell it. Thank totally you. Sell it. The idea is that it's a gift book. It's 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 humor. It's meant oh, for the man. casual fan. It's the kind of book your grandma would buy for you when she's shopping for your birthday and she knows you like Star Trek. That kind of thing. Right. Yeah. You know, I wanted well, to be able to show Dayton, up. Anyway. Dayton would like this one. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I really want it. That's and that's the that's the way they they marketed it as, as a gift book. It's a six by six or seven by seven. So that's the idea. It's a humor book. You find it in the humor section at your bookstore. Right. So, yeah. Oh, it's. I I think it's hysterical. I I think it's. Uh, honestly, I think it's something I'm going to have to get for myself and and take a little bit more of a look at. It's definitely you know, a conversation starter when people walk in and look at your bookshelves and go. Huh? <laughs> Some people on our, our web page are gonna love that too yeah. yeah we'll make sure we share it there yeah, definitely now as i've told every author that who's who's come onto the show i'm not a creative writer i can write factual functional things no problem uh i'm always impressed by how the creative author's mind works and functions or doesn't function uh, as the case may be are you talking about me again i am i didn't <laughs> i didn't think you'd pick up on it that quickly <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder, with an established universe such as Star Trek, do you feel that it constricts or promotes your creativity? Because after all, you write about established characters in the Trekkerverse, such as Jean-Luc Picard and, and James T. Kirk and, and all these other guys. How do you feel that affects your creativity? 
I don't think it constrains it. I think it focuses it. Um, it's you're working within the rules established within a universe, but you do that if you're writing your own made up universe or your made up fantasy world or whatever you, you create the rules by which that universe, you know, exists. And then you have to write your stories to conform to what you have your, created yourself. I just didn't create the universe that I'm working in. Uh, but I'm familiar with it. I've loved it all my life and I don't view it as a constraint. I view it as a challenge. How can I bring you the Star Trek fan? I know not you personally, because apparently you don't like Star Trek, but I forgive you. <laughs> and the rest of us do. So. so for the people who follow this stuff and watch the shows and they've read the books, you know, what, what is it I can do to bring something new to, the, to them? What, what can I do that hasn't been necessarily done before or not done quite that way before? Um, when you're writing for characters like Kirk and Spock and the crew of the Enterprise and you set it during the time frame of the original show, you know you can't kill them off. You can't really introduce right. any major yeah. changes to them. So it's it's the ride that has to be worth it. You know, they got it's got to be worth getting on the roller coaster. Um, but and if I can introduce a little something that you maybe didn't know about those characters before you read the book, that's okay. cool. Too. But, you know, I'm always you're always working on the auspices of CBS's good graces. They're the ones who, yeah. who review and approve all this stuff. And for the most part, I've, you know, I've had a very favorable relationship for going on 20 years now working with, with uh, the people oh, yeah. of Star Trek. So well, awesome. they let me get away with it. And then they let me goof off on Twitter and be an idiot <laughs> on Facebook. And stuff. Right. <laughs> because I have to imagine that's a pretty tightly controlled universe and tightly overseen because it's, it's such a, an iconic brand, really you know that's really they are very you know the people who work in the licensing group at cbs they are fans themselves and they're not just casual fans they're hardcore i mean it's you, it's hard for you to get something over on them when it comes to the lore or the mythology if you will they they know their stuff and if they if if somebody fails the next person in line will catch the gap you know they'll fill that gap so they're fans but they want everything to work so they you know they work with us to you know if we do something that they think doesn't quite ring true for the characters they'll lead us back to the road uh but it's never it's never a negative relationship it's always very collaborative you know they 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 want every book to do well they want every comic to do well uh, so it's been a lot of fun they give us a lot of leeway too they give us you know at this point there's an air of trust or there, there's a level of trust where they know that, oh, so-and-so is writing a book. Well, all right, I sh he's not going to screw things up too badly. They're giving Ward another book. He should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> the last one didn't hurt us too badly. We'll, we'll yeah, keep the last going. one didn't, didn't tank that badly. We can give another one. <laughs> there you go. So a non-sci-fi question for you. I understand that you're originally from Florida and a lifelong Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. Is that true? This is true. That is true. That's okay. True. Now, as a football fan, I want to tease you about the orange creamsicle uniforms of the 80s and early 90s. <laughs> However, oh. as a Detroit Lions fan, I'm going to sit down and shut up. There you uh, go. <laughs> That's a good move. <laughs> right, right? Oh, um, I was, yeah. So, so what's the question in there? The, the question is, <laughs> is <laughs> how excited were you when you the news broke that the Bucks got the GOAT? And for the non-football fans, we're talking about Tom Brady – and then, and then secondly, <laughs> you got Gronk, Rob Gronkowski, his favorite receiver when he was right. in, with the Patriots. So how Full excited, how excited were you? And then secondly, what's it like to be a fan of a team with a functional front office? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, and it's a relatively recent thing too. There was a lot of time there, there were a lot of years there where the Bucks did not have a functional front office. I've been a Bucks fan since day one, since the day they announced Tampa was getting a team. I was like eight when that happened um i my dad and i had season tickets we were there for oh and 26 i wore a bag on my head uh <laughs> i sh i used to actually, actually when i was a teenager i worked at the stadium walking up and down the stand selling concessions oh, i was wow. one of those guys so i that was how i earned that was my first summer job was working at the stadium doing soccer games oh, and football wow. games That's cool. um so you know long suffering buccaneers fan yeah <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> So, but um, when they got, when we, when we heard that they were coming, that they were going to get Brady, I've made my share of Brady and Patriot jokes. Don't get me wrong. He's been the butt of many a joke. Yeah. But once he puts on the Bucks uniform, he's a buck, you know, and I'm like, okay, he knows how to win a game. We know this. Right. Um, he knows how to win several. And then the, the Gronkowski thing, I was kind of shocked by that. I didn't think he would come out of retirement, but somehow they, either. They, yeah. they, they, they sweetened that deal enough for him to come back to work and right. so far 
it's I know this has been a weird year and it's been a weird football season and sports has been just kind of sideways, but I think it's starting to come together a little bit down there. Uh, if that last like game is. is any indication. Yeah, so. it's starting to look like it is. It'd be, I'm not, I'm not getting too excited. I'm not getting too puffed up. I'm not, you know, the idea of them being able to play the Super Bowl down in Tampa would be all right, but I'm not getting too carried away just yet. Just yet. Understood. Got a long way to go. <laughs> well, I had a question for, you know, every superhero has an origin story, right? <laughs> and I watched a lot of your interviews and uh, they all kind of cover your origin story. So I'm not going to go there. I, I think okay. lots of interviews, if people want to <laughs> see that, that's great. It's very interesting. I recommend they do. But I really got thinking about superheroes. And, and do you have uh, like uh, a favorite superhero or a superhero franchise that you like? You ever? I'm a, uh, I'm a Batman guy. You're a Batman? Yeah, I've always been a Batman guy. I mean, I've waffled between other ones, but I think the one that's consistently the one I go back to is Batman. I remember watching, you know, back when I was a kid, Batman was Adam West in reruns and yeah, Super yeah. Friends on on Saturday mornings. And at the time, at that age, I was cool. And then, you know, I read Batman comics, so I got to read some of the more serious stuff, like the stuff Danny O'Neill would write. Yeah. Or stuff Neil Adams would do. And... You know, I'm trying to square these in my little nine-year-old head. Like, I don't understand how these are the same guy. You know, where's the Kapow and the Riddler and the Tilted Rooms and stuff? I had the lunch. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I uh, I went away from comics for a while. And then I was living in California. And that was right about the time that Dark Knight Returns hit oh, stands yeah. for the first time. So I kind of grabbed it because it looked interesting. And that hooked me right back in. I've been reading comics ever since. Nice. And uh, so then the 89 Batman movie came along. And if you were around in 89, people were insane for Batman that summer. It was Batman and everything else. And I had just come home from being overseas that summer. So I didn't get to see the movie until like a month after everybody else had already seen it three times. Oh. And it was still packing theaters when I got back. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. So it's Batman, crazy. Batman's my guy. Always has been. <laughs> okay. So our show looks up that one. Our group, there you go. <laughs> you, you're going to take that? All right, good. Uh, our show is always focused on what's fun and funny in science fiction. And when it comes to funny writing, uh, do you have an author who that you've read that is like a go-to inspiration for you when you try to inject humor into a story? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that there's any one particular writer, but I do. And I don't even know it's necessarily a science fiction writer. I just, right. I like the comedy written by people like Larry Gelbart, who was, you know, so much of MASH. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Aaron Sorkin can be very funny when he wants yes. to be and also very dramatic. So people like that, because I don't know that I've ever written anything that's just outright funny. I, I try to inject humor, right. but I don't, I can't claim to be a humor writer, you know. I can be a smart aleck, but I, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can necessarily come across as being a comedian. Um, so I look to people like that and, um, you know, people like John Scalzi who injects a lot of humor and levity into his work. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know that I, I don't know that I go to them consciously, but they are people that I think of when I, when you ask that question. Oh, good. Great. Uh, I know most of these podcast interviews have some uh, cringeworthy questions at times. <laughs> So aside from this question, what's the worst question you've ever been asked in an author interview? And if it was one of Tim's just now, it's okay to tell us. He's got, <laughs> you know, he can handle it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, other than the usual stale questions, which is like, where do you get your ideas from? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I do get kind of, Dayton? where do yeah, you get I, your idea from? Yeah, I have a, I have a club that gives me a book or a box that drops them off. Every day. It's like idea crate. So, um, I guess the, just the usual, you know, the questions that I've been asked a thousand times when I know they're going to ask me like, you know, how did you get started in writing or how did you become a Star Trek fan? Or usually when, because I write a lot of Star Trek, I get a lot of Star Trek questions. What's your favorite episode? What's your favorite ship? What's your favorite captain? You know, who would you want to be when you, and I'm like, I, it's not, it's not a way of life. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's entertainment. Uh, I don't imagine myself on the bridge of the enterprise. Well, not much. I mean, I might have, um, <laughs> but, uh, those are the kinds of questions that I really don't have much to say about because I'm like, we could talk right. about favorite episodes, but that it gets kind of boring after a while. Right. And it changes too. Uh, the question will change. The answer will change every time you, you know. Exactly. I noticed from your Wikipedia page, if you're a big 
fan of the band Rush. Is that correct? Yes. So is your favorite Getty Lee song Take Off to the Great White North with Bob and Doug? <laughs> The funny thing is, I I, th- I think I heard that song. I heard that song before I became a Rush fan. And I knew who, I knew who Rush was. And yeah. I, when I was a kid, I knew who Rush was, and because the radio would play the same three songs. Yeah. yeah. And um, I knew who Getty Lee was because they would always say it when they intro the song on the radio that it's Rush's Getty Lee. Or I did not become a Rush fan until I was stationed overseas, and my roommate who's a huge music fan, every Sunday would crank these giant speakers that everybody bought in the 80s. The yeah. ones that were so big, you had to live in another room. Mm-hmm. And he would crank his stereo all day on Sunday and he'd open up the windows and open up the doors. And every Sunday was a different band and he would play everything he had. And one Sunday it was Rush. And so by the end of that Sunday, I was a convert. I was, you know, the whole <laughs> Trinity, Getty, Alex, Neil for life. And so... Uh, the first concert my wife, who was then my fiance, and I went to was a Rush concert. This was back in 1990 or whatever. And we have not missed a concert. We had not missed a concert ever since. Ever so since. sometimes we would travel to other cities and catch them in different places we wanted to go, like Vegas or down in Florida. That's or cool. Yeah. Good time. Nice. Cool. Great. Fun. So I don't think you can talk about Star Trek without actually thinking, at least for a moment, about the holodeck. And how cool that would be to be dropped in the middle of a story, to actually feel things around you, smell them, like, like to have that visceral of an experience, <laughs> you know, in, in just like, that, that technology is just insane, right? So I don't know if you've been asked this before, but could you tell me what you would want to do on a holodeck and keep Deanna <laughs> Troy and Seven and Nine out of it, please? <laughs> I would like an environment where I could sleep uninterrupted for eight hours at a time. Can we have that? I, uh, I mean, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, so I've, I've been like, there. yeah, I'm like, I can't, the remember the time, I can't remember a time when my daughters weren't talking. Right? <laughs> Things like that. Um, yeah, I can't remember the last time I had eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. Um, no, so I mean, just sleeping. Just sleeping. Wait, I would like to be un- unconscious during those moments on the holodeck. Thanks. I guess if, 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 if it was... A technology available to us today. Yeah, I would want to travel somewhere that I had never been on on Earth, obviously. So someplace over in Europe or someplace down under. Like I've never been to Australia. I've never been to Scotland. I've never been to you know Ireland or anything like that. I would probably do that, or I would just find that beach on Fiji, and that would be my my eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. You know, and I'd, I'd put my hand up, and somebody would periodically put a drink in it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a do solid you see your- plan. Do you see yourself, um, you know, when that technology comes out, you know, uh, three years from now, as you know it will, um, do you see yourself switching over to a holodeck writer instead? I have no idea. Yeah, that'd be fun. Writing a holo program? That'd be yeah. Pretty cool. I mean, I know they have the VR ocular, the Oculus. Uh, it's not the same. <laughs> I don't know. I've never tried one. And uh, it's for me, it's the same reason I don't have an Xbox within easy reach of where I work. Mm-hmm. Because if I had that technology, I would never get anything done. Yeah, that's just, that's me i would just yeah, play this, games all day i mean we this, have an xbox it's upstairs my daughters play and I'm, I'm i just look at it and go i can't <laughs> sit here i've got to go work i've got to go yeah. be in a productive adult i've got to go be an yep. adult i'm gonna go do some adulting it's right there that really what, Tim? Tim's um so yeah for my the same xbox reason that, you know if a holodeck right was to be installed <laughs> yeah that'd be the yeah. same that'd be in a holodeck i'd just be inside the holodeck you know playing playing some kind of stupid holodeck game <laughs> yeah and, exactly until dinner <laughs> yeah <laughs> And that, that's seriously the same thing with me. I, I had an Oculus in the office and stuff, and I played it quite a bit. And I was just like, you know what? I got to sell this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just sold it. I, mean, I, like, <laughs> I literally have a Star Trek arcade game in my office, in the corner oh, of my awesome. office. And it, it, the only reason I don't play it as much as I used to is because it doesn't work as well as it used to. And I need to get yeah. prepared. But there was a time there where, I, like, if I'm taking a break from writing, I would totally fire it up and play a few rounds on that, you know, from an old 80s style arcade game. It was one of the first things I bought when I bought our first house. Nice. I was like, I'm totally buying this thing. First piece of furniture that went in my office was a stupid arcade game. And my wife has informed me that that is the casket when I die. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. I think your wife and my, my wife might actually get along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's like, all that crap, as much as I can fit in there, is going in there with you. So, all right. Yeah. 
So you've obviously done a lot of thinking about how various characters in Star Trek would react in certain situations, right? That's okay. kind of a no-brainer, right? I sensed the trap coming, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask, what, what character do you connect with the most, but also which one do you just struggle to really understand? <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, why would they do that? But yet that's them. That's what they do. Like anything right. like that. I seem to have an easy time writing um, Kirk and Picard in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why. I don't claim any special understanding of the character. Yeah. I just, I tend, I guess because there's sort of a, there's a pseudo military mindset to either one of them. I guess I can identify with them. Okay. Same, uh, you know, with lesser extent with Riker and some of the other characters. The ones that I struggle with sometimes are usually like Worf and um, not so much Spock, but Worf in particular. Klingons are always an interesting way, you know, an interesting challenge to write because yeah. there's a stereotype about Klingons and you're always trying to defy the stereotype. So when I have a book that's Klingon heavy and I have different types of Klingons in it, I always try to introduce different personality quirks and different just things to defy the stereotype so that they're not all the same. We're all about honor. We're all about glory. Ah. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. There's only so much of that you can do. And exactly. it's, it's sort of like writing a political storyline, which we did for a while there, where it seemed like every book was was some sort of political angle. I'm like, I don't really like politics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'll, I, mean I'm, I try to be engaged about politics and real world issues, but I don't like writing about it. Mm -hmm. And so when, when, when a story drives that, it, you know, and then you have to deal with the characters in these situations, I'm just like, I hate this. This is not, <laughs> what, this is not what I wanted to, this is not what I signed up for. Right. Yeah. This was not in the brochure. <laughs> and so I, I just, I do struggle with characters like Worf because I want to do something other than, I want to do something like they did with him in DS9 where they really fleshed him out and they really gave him a background that just sort of pushed back against what you think of when you think about Klingons. So that's an example. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes tons of sense. Voice. So you've won a number of awards. You've been nominated six times, won twice for the Scribe Award, the International Association of Media and Tie-In Writers. Through all that, you've had ups and downs, right? Who has I would say so. Yeah, we all so, have. So what have you, or can you think to a moment that you found actually, out of all that, most fulfilling for you? And then also I'd like to know what, What's the most grueling thing for you about what, what you've what you've done, what you've accomplished? What's what the grueling one? Yeah, both. I, I want to know what what's been most fulfilling. What's been most kind of grueling? What's been the thing? That's... I think. Well, the most fulfilling one is the the relationships I've made, uh, the friends I've made, uh, other writers, other fans. Going to conventions, you re, you know, you meet people on social media, then you get to put a face to them. They tell you they like your book you have a nice moment um you get to interact with them on social media a lot and we have we have my my deal with social media is i try not to make it about marketing me it's just i'm out there on social media being another idiot on social media i just happen to be a guy that read that writes stuff that other people read um <laughs> perfect as far for as the, i but i enjoy the relationships i, I like the opportunity the opportunities are fun i love working star trek i'm a lifelong fan so being able to work closely with people who make star trek is kind of a dream job it's it's really hard to call it work some days yeah uh in fact there are days when i sit back and i go i can't believe they're paying me to do this this is so ridiculous <laughs> my guidance counselor completely owes me an apology right? <laughs> um, and, and my mother who used to tell me i don't understand why you watch that crap it'll never amount to anything right <laughs> you know? Look at me now, mama. Look at me now, dad. <laughs> so, um, and I never, you know, don't get me wrong. I did not see myself in this line of work. I was a, I was a software developer and I thought that was going to be my life until I, you know, had my midlife crisis and went off and became a park ranger or something. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I kind of backed my way into this whole writing career turned consultant turned Star Trek guru person thing so i don't know how you put that on a resume <laughs> i think like, you read it just like that it's really <laughs> difficult to explain to normal functioning adults what i do for a living yeah, some days. right i've um, never so, met so. right yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as the grueling part you know writing it, it's hard writing is hard right it's there are days when you your brain just doesn't want to do it it doesn't want to want to sit down you your brain turns to mush all of a sudden you're interested in recataloging all your DVDs by the last name of the grip black movie. You know, it's like, 
and and there's there's the deadliest catch marathon and, and all that stuff that I could, <laughs> it shows that I could not have cared less about a minute ago are now the greatest thing ever because it keeps me from writing. Right. And, and then you still have to put all that aside and do it. I mean, you, you just have to get your whatever your whatever I have to get done that day has to be done because if I don't do it, then it's twice as much tomorrow or, or whatever. Uh, there are just days when it's hard, particularly this year. This year is weird. Yeah. I mean, this is I work at home anyway. But at least before the apocalypse, you had the, you know, I'm like, I can go on vacation. I can go to some place. We can take the kids out for a movie or the mall or whatever. And you oh. can't do any of that. Yeah. So, yeah. It's insane. I, I've started this new saying I've been talking to myself about regarding discipline. I've started to say that a lack of discipline is like going in debt to your future. That's a good way to put that. And I was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so true. Because if I go, if I make all these excuses as to why I can't do that thing in the moment, such as put this stuff away once I'm done with it or whatever, it's it, it it's like going in debt to your future. Right. I'm trying to teach my kids that. It's hard to talk about how much I own my future. <laughs> my kids are, you know, they're learning they're learning at home for school right now. They're home full time doing yeah. school. Yeah. And I've been trying to instill them with good habits, good discipline. You know, it's like, don't, you don't lay around in your pajamas all day. Right. I work, I've been working at home for 12 years at this point, 12, 13 years. And I still, every day I get up, I get dressed, I do my morning routine. I, mm -hmm. I separate myself from, from couch potato date, mm -hmm. you know, who's a very prominent presence in my life. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, yep. But I, I mean, I, I, there's a mental switch that flips when I get dressed and get out of my you know, sleep clothes and I go to work. I come down to my office. There's a, there's a commute. It's 17 stairs down the friggin' thing. And so, <laughs> but I, I tell them the same thing. I'm like, don't, don't sit in your bed and do your schoolwork. Get up yeah. downstairs, mm -hmm. get dressed. You know, you work before you play that kind of thing. We, you know, it's just, and that's, that's, there's a lot of things that go into why I do the things I do. I mean, my mother was, a, was I don't want to go as so far as to say Nazi, but she was militant when it came to like <laughs> discipline and, and, you know, clean house, discipline, routines, all this kind of stuff. Right. And my dad was no better because he's a retired Marine. So, you know, my life was. <laughs> and, and then, of course, I went to service. So all that stuff gets reinforced. And so I have just decades of old habits that will never break. And, you know, yeah. I've been trying to push it on my kids. It's like, don't you work first, then you play. Yep. And then, of course, as soon as they go upstairs to work, I turn on the Xbox. Yep. So, <laughs> Speaking of playing, um, yeah. I love toys and I love games. And uh, I noticed you brought up your, your Trek arcade game. I think that's awesome. Uh, we have an arcade game, too. It's not Trekky, but it's just <laughs> something fun. So um, I wanted to know, when you do play your Trekky game on your writer lazy days... <laughs> What's your highest level you reach? <laughs> well, I uh, see the beauty of it is, is mine. So I have all the high scores. I, yeah. There you <laughs> go. There you go. And then, you know, then of course I turn off the machine and it all wipes the memory. So it starts all over again. And oh, I still oh. have the high score oh, guy. That's a bummer. <laughs> um, but I have you know, my writing partner, my friend, my, my friend and my writing partner, Kevin, uh, he, he, uh, he has a Tron arcade game nice. at his house. And then he recently bought one of those newer versions of the Star Wars arcade game that you get at Walmart or something, the $400 jazz right. thing where it's got. And so here we are, two mature adult men, and we spend Sunday afternoon playing this stupid arcade game like we're 15 years old again. Right. And, <laughs> and praying to God that neither of our significant others find us. <laughs> <laughs> So true. But I mean, it's it's been it's, it's sort of a running joke. It's like, well, at least you have somebody to go play with. You can leave me alone. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, the thing is, the difference is, is now that you're a mature man, we'll use the finger quotes, mature man with mature man money, and so now you can go back and buy those things, and it's you know, yeah. And my daughters like to play too. I mean, we go, we still do. Well, okay, again, before the world ended, you know, we would totally go to some place like Dave and Buster's or an arcade that we had here in town, and they love the old school arcade games. So we would nice. I would teach them. I'm like, I, I grew up in the arcades. I, I lost so many quarters to those things. I could probably have bought a house. And yeah. so, but the games that they have today make them look, there's just no comparison, you know, compared to what, we, what kids are, or what we are having to play today. The arcades of my youth are just ridiculously primitive, but there's still something about them. That's fun. Still fun. Um, but yeah, we'll go and, you know, the, we'll, the three or four of us will go 
play at an arcade and I'm just like them, you know, we'll, they'll, we'll challenge each other to the games. We'll play laser tag. We'll, uh, we'll do whatever. Yeah. They've, they've right. killed me at laser tag. I'm getting old. So, <laughs> there was a time when I would have bested them all, but those days are behind me. We've all seen the classic uh, Trek with uh, Kirk and trouble with tribbles. Um, do tribbles ever make their appearance again? And have we learned any more about their species? I mean, surely we must have learned something more about tribbles about that race recently. In well, time. Uh, if you're not paying attention to the new Star Trek shows that are on, they you know there's Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks, but they also have this series called Short Treks, which are these little eight to fifteen minute vignettes, and one of them is called The Trouble with Edward, <laughs> and it offers an here, heretofore unknown backstory about the tribbles. Oh. Um, it's worth oh, nice. checking out. Okay. Yeah, trouble with Edward. Trouble Streaming with on Edward. CBS All Access. Edward. All Access. Yeah, we have that. So trouble with Edward. Going to be my that. next show. Got it. Because I could figure out, like, the, what environment would they come up in where they wouldn't totally destroy? You know, it would have to be a unique space. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was the there was uh, there was the DS9 Tribble episode that kind of yeah. used Tribble Trouble with Tribbles footage, and they they offer some backstory about how the Klingons destroyed their planet or something yeah. at some point. I was going to wonder, yeah. do they age? Are they all gray now? Yeah, great <laughs> I don't know if it's has their life cycle ever actually been chronicled. I don't know. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Do they transform into something else? Might be fun. Well, that's that's a thought that's going to fester. Okay. Oh, yeah. no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when you write it, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds right. like a great energy source to me, or something like that. Just yeah. you know, shovel full of tribbles in the in yeah. the generator. You know. <laughs> There's a, there's a scene in the trouble with Edward where there's they're trying to clean up their ship with tribbles and there's a guy walking around with one of these giant like it's almost like a like a giant backpack and it's got a big <laughs> tube that goes over his shoulder and he's walking around and you can hear the triple <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> yeah. so, because you're trying to pick it's kind of funny it's a great it's a great sight gag yeah I want to see that trouble uh, with I that one. That one we'll have to post that it's great um, all right now comes the time on our show where we have a little bit of fun we play a game with our guests and I uh, hope you're uh, up for this. What we did this time is we polled our 87,000 member Funny Science Fiction Facebook group with a couple of Star Trek questions, some fun ones. Uh, now, I gotta let you know our group is composed of sci-fi fans from all franchises, so some of Ooh. these answers are a bit off. <laughs> Star Wars. But, uh, I like all kinds of science fiction. I like Star Wars, Doctor Who, right. Battlestar Galactica. Right. I'm yeah. all over the map. Well, great. So, uh, these were all Star Trek questions. So how, how we're going to do this is a little bit like Family Feud, but we simplified it. Um, the uh, You get three points if you pick the most popular answer, two mm. points uh, for the second most popular answer, and one point for the third most popular answer, and zero if it's below that. Okay? Okay. All right. Now, there's some prizes here. So this is, you know, we're... If you get 12 or more points, you get a autographed version of my book, Custodians of the Cosmos, which I neglected get to put on my shelf, so we'll pick up a picture, <laughs> uh, which is a uh, little bit of a Star uh -huh. Trek parody that I wrote a few years ago that I had a lot of fun with. Uh, at seven points, we get the, you'll get one of our, I gave the red shirt, what was Americans fun months? And then six or less, you have the abject humiliation of failing the test and of course uh we okay threatened, we threatened to put your head on a meme okay <laughs> are you are you are you good with that oh yeah this can't possibly be worse than you know <laughs> you say that now yeah <laughs> where do you get your ideas no <laughs> all right let's go ahead and get started with uh josh has the first question all right. This question is, which captain was most likely to shoot first? Kirk. So, Kirk. Kirk. Yeah. Kirk was the number one answer at 335 members stating Kirk. <laughs> there was your number one answer. That was three points on the board. That second was Cisco at 25. Third, Jonathan Archer at 12. Janeway at six, and somebody, <laughs> a couple of people wrote on solo. <laughs> I was not one of them. Well, <laughs> in that crossover that we haven't seen. That's yeah. right. That's right. That upcoming crossover. Everybody's. Hey, if you did a crossover with with 
uh, Solo and Chewie would at least explain where the tribbles came from because oh, they, boy. <laughs> they purr, you know, and the uh, Wookiees go, so maybe that's... Yeah. They're just all hairballs. They're, they're Wookiee yeah, exactly. hairballs. <laughs> Pulling them out that's, of the shower drains. That's derogatory, Dean. That's gross. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next Star Trek poll. Um, which is your favorite alien race in the Star Trek universe? Now, remember, this is their answer. Right. Their favorite race is their favorite. I'm gonna. I'll guess Klingons. Yep, Three you points. got it right. right. You got the number one. Are, are we sharing our screens with him? Is is that what's going on? <laughs> can you see our screens? You know, can see the reflections. I can see the answers reflected in your glass. He knows who he's writing for. Um, Vulcan right. came in number two. Very close uh, second. The Q came in, came in third, and and Tribbles ranked number four. <laughs> okay. So, which race or group has the coolest starships? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, the coolest ship. I'm going to guess Romulans just to see something different. Romulans were third. That's one point. Okay. Yeah, so one point there. First that's okay. I'm off, the, I'm, off the, I'm off the humiliation oh, scale. So yeah, you get a mug. You passed it. You're, you're, on, the, you're on the Great mug. List. All right. You, you get, what was the first one? You get mugged. First place was Federation. Oh, Second so place. That, that surprised me, actually. Second place was Klingons. Uh, so third place was Rymulin. Fourth was the Borg, because people <laughs> just love cubes. You're just a cube. And uh, in last place was the Time Lords. Really? <laughs> time Lords? <laughs> Somebody okay. wrote in Time Lords. Another Again, crossover. Another crossover we haven't yeah. done yet. Yeah, three, <laughs> well, three people wrote in the Time Lords, Josh. Not one, three. Three. So, oh, my. Oh, it says five. No, five. Five. <clears throat> it was 3% three percent of three percent. Oh, three percent. I'm sorry. Yeah, five people, actually. Okay. All right. So our next question, because uh, I allowed people to add, quite, uh, add content and answers beyond what I wrote, because I wasn't going to think of everything. So I asked what the best monster, and I have to say, <laughs> including races from Star Trek, because a lot of people answered with the races that they considered monstrous, all right? So what is the best monster slash race? Uh, as the best race? monster. Um, it's probably going to be the Borg, but I'll guess Gorn. Oh! Wait, you want to reverse that? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> it it doesn't matter. I still come up with points either way, you right? Got so You got number three, the Gorn. It was okay. Borg at uh, 42. Tribbles were number two. <laughs> which kept, blew me away. Then the is that a monster? Then the has a Tribbles fit. That's not a monster. <laughs> I know. I know. That's, but You'd have to know you our group. With, <laughs> that's <laughs> something you pick up with a dustpan. That's not a monster. <laughs> right. There was a, a tie for third place. It was the Gorn, the Horda, and Spider Barkley. <laughs> Spider Barkley. Spider that, is a, Barkley. that is a okay. scary one. You know what? That person or, or those people should get, you know, a, a high five because that's outside the box, right? There now. you yes, go. Yeah. I like that one. All right. You ready for number five? Okay. Who is the best engineer on Star Trek? If it's not Montgomery Scott, this interview is over. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> yeah, it was Montgomery Scott. 209 okay. of the people. We just put the poll up like yeah. yesterday. Yeah, so. 69%. Yeah, that's yeah we put it up later. Jordy LaForge so. came in second. Miles O'Brien came in third. Seven and nine made the list in Trip Tucker. So, okay. I might have flipped. I might have flipped O'Brien and LaForge, but I don't know. That's just me. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like. I like. I like him because he's one of those roll your sleeves up, get your hands dirty kind of engineers. He is cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, Brian, I always. I like to tell jokes about O'Brien because he's. he's <laughs> He's great material. <laughs> Look at old red-headed uh, engineer. So I gave him 11 points. Great. Awesome. Well, well done you. 11. Okay. Okay. That's good. So, you know what? You were close enough. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, <laughs> one point off. One of my books anyways. Uh, my great book. on a curve. All right. Yeah, it's yes, on a it's curve. Great on yeah. a curve. <laughs> I, will, I will gift him one of, one of my points that I don't have. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You've been a good sport and uh, playing along with us, and that was uh, that was a fun uh, fun little bit there. Well, and uh, you know, we wanted to make sure we have our guests know where people can go to find all about you and your work and what you're currently promoting. 
So this is your opportunity to tell us about what's what's fun and exciting about uh, Dayton Ward. Well, you can find me on the web at uh, DaytonWard.com, and from there you'll be able to you'll find links to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and blog and all that other banality that I cast out amongst the <laughs> interwebs. Um, as far as promotion, yes, I did bring a couple of books to promote. Um, the most recent release, um, it's called It Came From the Multiplex, and it's an anthology of 80s-inspired horror stories where they all take place in and around movie theaters and or are related okay. to that sort of setting. Um, right. Grew up in the 80s, you like movies uh, like Return of the Living Dead and Fright Night and... and, and uh, oh, the Critter. classic slashers classic stuff you know the, the funnier stuff not the serious not the hardcore slashers like friday the 13th but okay. yeah, all the okay. stories are inspired by those types of horror films from the 80s which we all grew up with and including some of the sillier ones like trancers and forbidden zone and critters yeah uh, so that came out from a, from a publisher uh, they're they're called hex publishers they're out of colorado with a very small press but uh so they're they're having a hard you know they have a hard challenge competing with the big new york city publishers so give them a shout out Right. And then, of course, my latest Star Trek novel is called Agents of Influence, and it's an original series tale set with uh, Kirk and Spock in the five-year mission, and I came out in June, So, right. but I'm awesome. still going to get that one. Sweet. Excellent. And, of course, the Kirk Fu Manual. And the Kirk Fu Manual, which oh. came out literally <laughs> as the apocalypse was descending upon us. It came oh, out wow. on March 15th. Mr. Ward was kind enough to send along an autographed copy of a hilarious Star Trek Kirk Fu Manual, along with a poster for us to offer at auction to benefit the Wish Upon a Teen charity. I didn't get a chance to promote it like I would have at conventions and stuff. So yeah, yeah. somehow we got to get we got to get William Shatner to like act all those back out, you know, there step you by step. Yeah, he's like eighty nine, I think. I know what. You know, I still go, think he'd do it. <laughs> you know what? If you go to uh, if you I don't know if you all have heard about it, but there's the uh, the original series set tour that's up in Ticonderoga, where they have recreated the sets of the original show. Oh and wow. Shatner comes out there a couple of times a year for special weekends yeah. and he will absolutely demonstrate some of the moves and stuff with the people oh. that are there. So you're, oh, in, fantastic. you're in engineering and he's showing you how to take a punch and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's, <laughs> really, that's awesome. That is surreal. We'll just close uh, the tribbles. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, wonderful. We'll put all that information in the description. Any photos you share with us, we'll uh, pop into the video along with uh, in our description as well. So, Everybody that's listening, thank you so much. Please don't forget to subscribe. By subscribing, you'll not only help us, but uh, get the word out about our, chari our charity, Wish Upon a Team, and the amazing work that they're doing as well. And once again, thank you so much for listening. And if the show wasn't to your liking, we guarantee to put 42 cents toward the research uh, toward generating power from buttered cats. <laughs> Lastly, please remember those listening while driving, yes, where, remember where you're going. We do need roads and keep it under 88 miles per hour, even if you are driving the DeLorean. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Everyone. Goodbye. Thank now. you, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. See ya. It would be seriously unfortunate if we failed to mention the charity, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund. We all know 11 minutes into episode 37, our dear Red Shirt crew member will land on the planet Neural and be attacked and bitten by a venomous ape like Mugato beast and die. It's good to know the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund will take care of his family. And remember that fictional charity for the Red Shirts, Widows, and Orphans Fund is connected to a very real charity now. And that is connected to the good folks over at Wish Upon a Team. So any merchandise that you buy of the Red Shirt, Widows, and Orphans Fund goes directly 100% to Wish Upon a Team. And the good thing that those folks do is they help out kids who have extended stays in hospitals and they help them to have a more comfortable stay. So let's help out our neighbors in a time of need and donate to Wish Upon a Team, either by direct merchandise purchase, purchases or going to their website, www.wishuponateam.org and making a direct donation through their website.